many people have gotten very interested in how their diet affects their blood sugar levels. And as a result, continuous glucose monitors or CGMs have gotten very popular, not just among people with diabetes, but also among people who are interested in optimizing their health. In general, I think this is a good development and I'm all in favor of people taking an active role in maintaining or improving their health. But many researchers and healthcare professionals, myself included, feel that how some people use their CGM is unlikely to actually benefit them. In this video, I will discuss four points that are key to making a continuous glucose monitor a tool for improved health. For those of you who are not clear about what a CGM is, these are small devices that attach to your skin with a very thin filament inserted into your skin. This filament measures the concentration of glucose in the interstitial fluid, which is the fluid around the body cells. Glucose levels in the interstitial fluid provide a reasonably good approximation of blood sugar levels. These CGMs typically measure glucose levels once every minute, thereby providing an almost continuous measurement of the ups and downs of glucose levels. So this is a very convenient and useful alternative to doing it the traditional way, which involves a finger prick with a little needle to obtain a drop of blood, and then using a glucose meter to get a one-time snapshot of your blood sugar concentration. So I am currently using a CGM. Specifically, I'm using the Vary app that obtains glucose data from a Freestyle Libre sensor. And this is what the data you get look like. This here is a pretty typical day for me. Here you can see my blood sugar levels while I slept. Then I got up, had some tea with milk, then breakfast, then a while later a snack, then lunch, probably a cup of coffee with milk afterwards, and then dinner. You can enter your meals and drinks and other factors that may affect your blood sugar levels, such as sleep, exercise, and stress. And then you can see how your blood sugar levels respond to each. It's actually pretty fun and interesting. Now that said, let me be clear that I don't normally use a CGM. I'm wearing this one right now because I'm making a whole series of videos on blood sugar regulation. And I want to be able to show you some actual data on how the science that we will be discussing in these videos can be translated to better personal control of your blood sugar levels. So I will be sharing a bunch of my own CGM data with you in the next few weeks to illustrate certain points. With that, let's get right to the meat of the video. The first point I suggest we need to keep in mind when we're using a CGM is that our blood sugar response is only one of many health effects of our food. Probably isn't a surprise to any of you that our diet affects our health in a myriad of ways. So how much a food affects our blood sugar levels is only one aspect of many we could be looking at. As a long-time clinical diabetes researcher, I'm the first to tell you that our blood sugar level is an important measurement to keep an eye on, but it's just one of many, and we should not use it by itself to judge whether a food is healthy. So when someone, be it on YouTube or in a scientific paper, argues that we should use our blood sugar response to foods to personalize what we eat, I suggest we are at least a little bit critical. The specific suggestion I have heard most often is that we should use a CGM to figure out which foods give us personally a blood sugar spike and then stay away from these foods. That sounds pretty plausible, but why haven't I jumped on that bandwagon? Just imagine a world that is maybe a little bit more technologically advanced than we currently are. And in that world, we also have, let's say, continuous fat monitors that tell us minute by minute the concentrations and composition of all the different fats in our blood. Or a continuous vitamin monitor that tells us the concentrations of all the vitamins in our blood and also our tissues, why not? Or a continuous gut microbiota monitor that provides information on the composition and function of our gut bacteria. So every minute we can see how happy those little guys in our gut are. You can probably imagine that the foods we eat would register very differently on the healthy versus unhealthy scale when it comes to these measurements, right? We don't have these technologies available, but just because we can measure our sugar levels so easily now, and we can't measure all this other stuff as well, should that mean that we base all of our food choices on blood sugar responses alone? Of course not, so please don't fall into this trap. At the very least, we could look at those other measures that are already available to us. Fasting lipids, blood pressure, biomarkers of inflammation, micronutrient status, and many more. All of these are established risk factors for one disease or another. If you use a CGM to figure out which way of eating keeps your sugar levels stable, 
that's great. But don't forget to also consider how that same diet affects all of the well-established biomarkers of disease risk. There's another reason to not just use your blood sugar response to a food as the only criterion to decide what you should and should not eat. Your blood sugar response to foods is not set in stone. As we will discuss in detail in future videos, you can affect your blood sugar response to foods by, for example, eating different combinations of foods in different order or by going on a walk after a meal. Or, and that brings us to the second point I'd like to make, you could try to improve your glucose tolerance so that your body is better able to handle whatever carbs you do eat. Because the second point I'd like to bring up is one that is almost never discussed in videos on CGM. A CGM measures the acute effects of a food or meal on blood sugar levels, but it doesn't measure the long-term effects of a food or meal on glucose tolerance. Let me explain. What you measure with a CGM is the acute short-term blood sugar response to a specific food. However, if you watched my last video about the regulation of blood sugar levels, you know that our bodies actively regulate our blood sugar levels. And the ability to keep blood sugars in the normal range is called glucose tolerance. Now, we'll get to this very point in a lot more detail in future videos, but the fact is that a food may be very good for your short-term blood sugar levels, but it may cause you, you know, your body, to become glucose intolerant from eating, you know, eating that food repeatedly. The case I'm making is that eating a way that optimizes glucose tolerance will also, in the long term, reduce your blood sugar levels throughout the day. But the effect of a food or meal on glucose tolerance doesn't immediately show up in your CGM data. It will take some time. Now, to illustrate this point more, let me show you some data from my own CGM. I regularly eat quite a bit of carbs, simply because I eat a lot of minimally processed plant foods. My blood sugar is usually in the 85 to 125 mg per deciliter range, and almost never exceeds 140 mg per deciliter. Let me show you an example. Here, I ate a dinner of a very large serving of veggies, including starchy veggies such as carrots, a few potatoes, and a little bit of chicken. My blood sugar increased from around 100 to about 110 milligrams per deciliter. Or here, I had a breakfast of four slices of bread with cheese and two boiled eggs. If you believe the low-carb gurus online, my blood sugar level should have gone through the roof after eating four slices of bread but it barely increased and topped out at about 120 milligrams per deciliter. If you're not clear what these numbers mean, by the way, make sure to watch our last video. So even on my pretty high carb diet, my HbA1c is around 4.8%, suggesting that my average blood sugar level throughout the day and night is somewhere around 90, 95 milligrams per deciliter. So the fact that I can eat a large amount of carbs in one meal and not experience a major glucose spike is the result of several factors, and we'll discuss these over the coming weeks and months on this channel. The main point I'd like to make here is that using the CGM to identify and then cut out foods that give you blood sugar spikes addresses only part of the problem. In my opinion, if you care about your blood sugar levels and your metabolic health, you should also want to improve your glucose tolerance, because glucose intolerance really is the core problem underlying excessive blood sugar responses to meals. So please be clear that the CGM will not acutely help you understand what the foods you eat do to your glucose tolerance. With that, let's get to the third point, and that is that I strongly suggest you keep your experiments with your CGM real. One temptation I see is that people, once they get their CGM, eat large quantities of isolated foods to figure out their glucose response to them. As an example, I was watching this fitness influencer here on YouTube the other day, she ate, I don't know, like three or four bell peppers raw all by themselves. That gave her a blood sugar spike, and then she concluded she should not eat bell peppers. You may see why I'm sharing this. How often do you eat three or four raw bell peppers all by themselves? I eat a lot of vegetables, but I don't think I have ever in my whole life eaten more than maybe one or maybe one and a half bell peppers at a time. And more importantly, I almost always eat them in a mixed dish, like a salad or a stir fry with fat and lots of other stuff. The glucose response to these mixed meals would be very different from eating large quantities of bell peppers by themselves. And that is a much more relevant measurement than creating an artificial experimental eating situation. So this YouTuber who now avoids bell peppers, I bet that if she ate a more reasonable amount of bell peppers with some fat and protein in a normal mixed dish, she would almost certainly not experience a major blood sugar response. 
So in my opinion, she'll miss out on a delicious and nutritious food from here on out, likely for no good reason. So my suggestion is to use the CGM to test the blood sugar response to the meals you actually eat, not some huge quantities of isolated foods that you otherwise have never eaten in your life. With that, I'd like to close with the fourth point I'd like to make, and that is, to me, the most important one of these four. Please do not obsess over every single increase in your blood sugar levels. I see a lot of people on YouTube who share their CGM data totally freak out whenever their blood sugar levels jump from like 100 to 120 milligrams per deciliter. They immediately start talking about blood sugar spike and needing to avoid these foods in the future. If you find yourself in a similar state of mind, staring at every little increase in your blood sugar data with horror, I have a suggestion. Please chill a little bit. Well, how can I say that? Isn't it clear, you may ask, that elevated blood sugar levels can cause health problems in the long term? Yes, that is true indeed, but I do think that it is very important to be clear about what we mean when we say high or elevated blood sugar. As we discussed in the last video, we have clear clinical guidance about what normal fasting glucose levels should be, less than 100 mg per deciliter, what normal glucose level should be two hours after drinking a 75 gram glucose beverage as part of an oral glucose tolerance test, less than 140 mg per deciliter, and what our average blood glucose should be, as measured by the glycated hemoglobin or HbA1c test, less than 5.7% in the HbA1c test, which is equivalent to an average blood glucose level of 117 mg per deciliter. At the same time, we have little clear guidance on what kind of blood sugar spikes are okay and what a normal range of blood sugar values throughout the day is. So allow me to share my framework of how I think about what I consider elevated versus normal blood sugar levels. So first, let's take a look at people who have diabetes. Usually their fasting blood sugar is 126 mg per deciliter or higher, and they typically spend a significant part of the day in the range above 180 mg per deciliter. In this group, it's not rare for patients to have blood sugar levels of 250 or 300 mg per deciliter, or higher even, after a meal. For people with blood sugar in that range, we have a lot of conclusive and strong evidence that lowering their blood sugar levels will benefit their long-term health. Next, we have people who have prediabetes. They often may have fasting glucose above 100 mg per deciliter, but not necessarily so, and they are likely to have sugar levels well above 140 mg per deciliter at least some of the time, sometimes maybe even exceeding 180 or 200 mg per deciliter. Again, we have good scientific evidence that those individuals here with prediabetes would benefit from lowering their blood sugar levels. Then we have a third group, less well-defined clinically, that does not yet meet the criteria for prediabetes but that does suffer from regular spikes in blood sugar levels to 180 mg per deciliter or so, or even higher. This is based on scientific literature showing that some supposedly healthy people unknowingly, meaning if they don't wear a CGM, have repeated blood sugar spikes after a meal to 180 mg per deciliter or even higher. There's a lot less scientific evidence available to know whether this group also suffers long-term health consequences from these excessive blood sugar spikes but I would judge it as likely that this carries some health risks. So yes, in my estimation, this group would also benefit from lowering blood glucose levels and specifically working towards avoiding these blood sugar spikes. I think here is where a CGM is a particularly powerful tool to detect these spiking patterns and enable you to do something about it. And then we have a fourth group with normal glucose tolerance and blood sugar in the 70 to 140 milligram per deciliter range. That range, 70 to 140 mg per deciliter, is based on looking at CGM data from healthy people with normal glucose tolerance. Based on several studies, such healthy people have blood sugar levels in that 70 to 140 mg per deciliter range at least 95% of the time. So I think it's reasonable to consider this as normal. Now, the big question that I'm sure many of you are wondering about, if you fall into this category, you have normal glucose tolerance and your blood sugar level is in the 70 to 140 mg per, de per deciliter range at least 95% of the time, do you still benefit from lowering your blood sugar levels and specifically minimizing blood sugar increases after a meal? Well, I'd say if you asked 10 diabetes researchers, you'd get 10 different answers because at this point, 
we just don't have a lot of strong data that have looked into that question. And those studies that are available are not super straightforward and require a bit of a more detailed discussion. I'll make a separate video about that literature in the near future. For now, let me say that my best guess is that all other things being equal, it may be a little bit better to have smaller blood sugar bumps and to maybe have sugar levels fluctuate in a tighter range, such as say 70 to 120 milligrams per deciliter. However, that is somewhat uncertain. And I'd argue that the benefit of you know, optimizing your sh blood sugar levels in this group is likely pretty small compared to improving your blood sugar levels in these three other groups. So this is why I suggest that if you use a CGM and you find that your sugar levels fall into this normal range here, chill and develop a bit of a relaxed relationship with your CGM. You are already in a great place and there just isn't that much more that you could optimize at this point. And in my opinion, the little bit of health benefits that may result from further optimizing your already close to optimal glucose levels are not worth stressing out about. One issue is that I think there's a very real risk here that our relationship with food becomes an unhappy one if we obsess too much over every little change in an individual health marker like blood glucose. Coming from a diabetes researcher, this message may surprise you. I don't want to be misunderstood, so let me reiterate that there is no doubt that long-term health benefits greatly from normalizing blood sugar levels if we have diabetes, pre-diabetes, or experience major blood sugar spikes. There may also be benefits to keeping you know, your blood sugar fairly level if you already have normal glucose tolerance, with glucose usually ranging between 70 and 140 milligrams per deciliter. Still, I want to emphasize that agonizing over every little up and down in your sugar levels is not likely healthy. I want to encourage you to consider you know, your whole body, your entire health, including your mental health, and not reduce your health to a single number based on a single health metric. Keep this in perspective. Look at the big picture and don't stress out over your CGM data. Then I think that wearing a continuous glucose monitor can be a great empowering tool for better health. All right, that's a wrap. As always, remember that the content of this video is not medical advice. And I suggest discussing your CGM data or any changes in your diet with a qualified professional, such as a registered dietitian or nutritionist or your physician. Hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you did, please leave a like and comment below if anything remains unclear or if you have any questions. Also make sure you're subscribed to the channel because I have a lot of content coming up in the near future about how our diet affects blood sugar regulation and how our blood sugar levels relate to the long-term risk of developing chronic diseases. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye.